Ah, that is excellent. Okay, uh, well, thank you so much for that uh, for that comprehensive introduction. Um, this is indeed uh, the, the the presentation about expressive risk five developments. I have subtitled it towards multi core multi core and more standard standardization. But we could have also called it, uh, you know, uh, let's just see what Espressive has been up to these uh, these last two years. So, uh, so as you already said, my name is Jeroen Domburg. Uh, I'm a senior software and technical marketing manager. Um, I also do hardware stuff, architecture, a, li a little bit of everything within Espressive. Um, about Espressive, um, yeah, you, you already kindly uh, uh, mentioned the main points there. Um, so we are in the business of AIoT, uh, which is a contra contraction of AI, artificial intelligence, and IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, we started out doing Internet of Things uh, chips, so chips that you put in little devices and widgets that connect to the Internet somehow, mostly via Wi-Fi initially. Uh, but we're now also uh, making headways into the AI uh, bit, um, especially edge uh, AI is is getting more and more important. Um, so we also make chips that that can do that and uh, develop software solutions for that as well. Um, we're a fabless chip company. That means that we do um, everything up to the actual manufacturing of the, the silicon um, uh, in-house. So uh, we make the designs, we design the IP, we do the, the tape out, etc. But the actual manufacturing of chips, we leave to TSMC. They're way better than us at that. Um, we are headquartered in Shanghai, in, uh, in China. Uh, but nowadays we are more or less a multinational company. We have offices all over the world, multiple in China. We have uh, um, uh, a research uh, uh, office in India. We design a bunch of software in Czech. Uh, nowadays I'm stationed in Singapore. We have a bunch of people in Brazil uh, doing interesting stuff. Um, so back in 2021, um, I already presented at the risk f five days uh, before that was in spring. And um, what I did there is talked about the ESP32 C3, which was a chip that uh, we had just introduced or were about to introduce. I'm not sure anymore. Um, and uh, the specific reason I wanted to talk about that was that that is uh, our first chip that used uh, a risk five architecture CPU as the main CPU. Um, and in this case, it ran at a nice 160 megahertz. Um, it also, uh, as I said, we're an IoT company, so it needs connectivity. Uh, and in this case, this chip has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, um, low energy uh, as, as radios to connect to the outside world. Uh, a few more specs, 400K of RAM. We have a bunch of peripherals in there. Um, I'll show you a bit more later. And uh, one of the reasons I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about it was that we did some things uh, differently because this is not a chip that is, uh, uh, this is not our first chip. We actually have a lineage of other chips that we uh, can also import things from. So since then, um, a lot of support has appeared. Uh, people seem to really like the chip. Uh, so ESP IDF, which is our own SDK, obviously supported it very early on. Um, Arduino followed soon after, so you could, uh, you know, write your Arduino uh, stuff and target it at ESP32 C3. Uh, but also other things, for instance, Rust support uh, also popped up pretty quickly, uh, up to no no standard lib uh, support as well as they call it. Uh, Nutix and Zephyr are two uh, very well renowned uh, open source uh, real time operating systems. They also supported it pretty quickly. Uh, and a bunch of other ecosystems as well. Toit, which is a, a new language, ESP Home, which is a framework. And there's a whole bunch of other ones that that, that fairly quickly uh, took up support for the ESP32 C3. So also people wrote books about it. Uh, Alexor um, uh, was, uh, uh, wanted to uh, write a, uh, a book about the RISC-V ISA, specifically architecture, uh, sorry, specifically assembly language programming. And they were nice enough to use the ESP32 C3 as their main target, uh, actual silicon target for it. Um, on the topic of books, uh, we also released a book ourselves, uh, which uses the ESP32 C3 as a vehicle to learn how to uh, program IoT devices. 
um, a little bit of a plug here. This book is actually a free download. If you put this into Google, you'll get the PDF from our, our official site. So uh, if you want to learn more about this, you can just read through the entire book freely if you want to. OK, one of the things that I that I mentioned uh, back in 2021 is that um, uh, one of the reasons that we might want to do this is because of cost improvements. And um, while I don't have the internal numbers for it uh, that I can release, I can I can give an example uh, on this. So this is our previous chip. Uh, this is an ESP8266 based chip, has an extensive core, has a few peripherals, um, uh, UART, uh, GPIO, SPI, uh, and that's it. Um, has uh, a little bit of memory, I think 200K or something, um, and only has Wi-Fi. And if you go to the Mouser website, you pay $1.20 for it. This is an ESP32C3 based chip. Um, it has Wi-Fi BLE, it has twice the amount of RAM, it has a whole bunch of peripherals, and you pay an additional four cents for that. So I would say that would, that, that, that has panned out. Um, if you think those four cents uh, still is too much, for instance, you can live with, with a lower amount of RAM and less peripherals. And then we also have the ESP32C2, which is uh, a uh, stripped down version of the ESP32C3, which is very useful if you want to make, for instance, uh, wireless light bulbs that don't really need that many peripherals. Um, I, I couldn't find like a, a, a real world, world market costs uh, for that very quickly, but um, if you buy these in large amount, it will cost you about 50 cents or so, I believe. So it's, it's, it's fairly um, cost optimized. So I would say that that we had a great success there, and uh, a lot of places uh, start using the C3 or, or or its little brother, the C2, as a replacement for the ESP8266, which is great because people can do more interesting things with it for lower cost. I mean, that's great. So obviously, since the C3, we haven't just been sitting on our la laurels doing nothing. Uh, we've actually been developing new products, and I'd like to introduce um, uh, those to you now. Um, some of them are already there. You can buy them. Uh, some of them are still in the um, engineering sample phase, and some of them haven't taped out yet. Um, so the first of all, I already mentioned, is the ESP32C2. Uh, it's the, it's the cost-down version of the C3. It still has all the radios, so you can still connect to it using Wi-Fi or BLE. Uh, but it only runs at 120 megahertz, which still is pretty fast. Um, it has less RAM and a few, uh, a few less peripherals. Uh, and that makes it cheaper, obviously. And um, it's, a, it's a pretty small chip. So here is um, actually a package that, um, uh, that was broken down using ACID. And what you can see here is uh, two chips. Uh, the top bit with the, with the blue um, uh, things on it is actually the flash chip. It's, uh, I think, two megabytes of flash that is die bonded to the actual C2 chip, uh, which is under that, which is not much bigger than the flash chip. So yeah, I think we, we, we succeeded in keeping it uh, cheap and small. Another newcomer is the ESP32H2. Um, this one is interesting because it does not have Wi-Fi. Um, it is made for uh, like consumer products um, um, uh, mesh networks. So it does have BLE as well as Zigbee, as well as the new Matter slash Thread um, uh, standard supports. So um, uh, it is it is meant to go into devices that you put in your home that can interoperate using those standards. Um, so it's not that fast. It's only 96 megahertz, um, uh, and it only has 320K of RAM. But because it doesn't uh, need to support the, the high throughput Wi-Fi uh, protocols, it, it doesn't really need that. And finally, because uh, also partially because we don't have Wi-Fi, um, uh, it can be lower power as well. So uh, then there's the ESP32C6, uh, which is uh, our first Wi-Fi 6 chip. Uh, aside from that, we also put all the, uh, uh, the usual suspects and the new protocols in there. So it has Bluetooth low energy. It also has Zigbee and Matter and Thread. Um, and Wi-Fi 6 is uh, specifically interesting because Wi-Fi 6 added a bunch of uh, features to uh, the protocol that allow for lower power uh, uh, usage in chips. 
So um, uh, in, in, in general, we also managed to um, uh, make the power uses of this chip a bit, uh, uh, bit better to control. So it is easy to make lower power devices with this that still connect to Wi-Fi, uh, uh, even without going into deep sleep or stuff like that. Um, aside from that, it's similar to the C3, uh, the, the peripherals, the memory, et cetera, is pretty similar. Um, the thing that we do have here is that we have given it a fairly fast uh, 40 megahertz, I think, low power risk five coprocessor. And the trick is that when the entire chip is asleep, this thing can still wake up and do sensor readings or, or update a display or things like that, uh, even while shipping power. Then we have the ESP32 P4, which goes in an entirely different direction. Uh, first of all, it doesn't have any radio at all, so no Wi-Fi, no Zigbee, no BLE. Uh, but it does have a dual uh, RISC-V core, and that is actually a high-power RISC-V core that is faster uh, per, uh, in, in CPU cycles, uh, sorry, in instructions per megahertz than uh, the other chips that we have. Uh, aside from that, it, it also runs at a very high 400 megahertz. So yeah, it's a beast. Um, it also has the low power with five co-processor. Um, it has um, a bunch of video peripherals as, as well. We uh, we think that people want to use this for video based things. So it also has um, uh, a bunch more RAM and you can actually also use the internal RAM as cache for a lot of external RAM as well. So uh, this is this is quite the powerful beast. Um, uh, if you still want to have a radio in your device, what you can do is you can just take a uh, one of our C-series chips and uh, uh, put it in your project as a companion chip. So if you want to go cheap, you can put a C2 in there. If you want to have Wi-Fi 6, you can put an, uh, a C6 in there, etc. So that's the way we're envisioning people to give connectivity to, the, to these things. Um, unfortunately, it's not out yet. Um, we expect it uh, to appear on the market. Um, well, I can't, I can't uh, really give a hard, hard timeline, uh, but uh, you'll see it appear at some point. So uh, just in case you're interested in what it looks like, so as a reference, this is the block diagram for the C3. So it has a bunch of peripherals, it has a risk five, et cetera, et cetera. If you keep the peripheral block in mind and compare that to the C2, then you can see it's actually stripped down by a fair bit. Uh, the, C, uh, the H2, on the other hand, does have a few more peripherals, um, uh, but uh, 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 in general, uh, it is lower power, so a bunch of those peripherals can be shut down if you want to, and obviously it doesn't have Wi-Fi. And the C6 has all the peripherals again and includes Wi-Fi and all the other things, and also the low-power uh, coprocessor. Finally, the P4, which uh, has a bunch of MIPI peripherals to attach cameras and, and uh, um, displays and stuff. Um, it has H.264. Uh, I think that is encoding, but I'm not sure. Uh, it has a JPEG codec and, and, and um, uh, uh, in there. So uh, you have a bunch of hardware accelerated imagery stuff. Uh, for connectivity, as I said, it does not have Wi-Fi or any other radio protocol, but it does have Ethernet and USB uh, high speed. So um, if you want to have a wired solution, this chip would be enough. Um, yeah, and aside from that, it has a whole slew of other general purpose peripherals. Okay. So um, I want to I want to dig a little bit deeper into the actual Risk Five Core uh, stuff uh, because obviously this is a Risk Five conference. So um, we made a few improvements over the way we uh, we we handled things earlier. So for instance, in the uh, two years ago, one of the things that I said was with regards to interrupts that we took our own route. We effectively took the solution we had from the Extensa days and ported that to Risk Five. And that means that it's effectively fully custom. Uh, we tr we're trying to get rid of that. Um, so the C6 at least have a clint, has a clint for a local interrupt. So that confirms to the risk five specs. And for the, the P4, we just uh, put a plick in there, uh, which is entirely risk five uh, compliant. So for risk five trace functionality, um, for the C3, it's very simple. It didn't have that. Um, if you want to run a trace on the C3 core, you can't. Um, for the six, oops. Uh, sorry. 
for the C6, um, the trace um, functionality um, was included. So you're now able to run a trace. And for the P4, we're going to implement the uh, V2 standard of the trace um, uh, uh, risk five trace standard. So it's going to be even nicer. Um, also, all of these chips will have the same USB serial JTAG peripheral uh, integrated that the C3 has. That means that in order to get at those traces or program the chip or uh, you know have serial communications. Uh, with it, all you need to do is connect a USB cable to the chip directly. Uh, you don't need uh, a JTAG adapter or USB to serial or any of those shenanigans. The chip will just support it directly, which is really nice. And, and um, uh, we've had a, uh, uh, a few good examples of people using that on the C3 very successfully. So another thing is uh, the ESP32 P3 actually is powerful enough to run Linux. Um, which is great. We have a proof of concept uh, 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 in-house that can that 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 can do that. However, uh, while this is very nice, um, this is actually not production quality. Um, it is a no MMU uh, version of Linux. Uh, we don't really see this as the main target, and we're not sure if we're gonna, you know, properly support it. Um, uh, we think that it's better to program these things in ESP IDF or NUTX or or any of the other. Um, you know, MCU-ish uh, uh, programming environments. So we also have a bunch of extra instructions. Um, uh, we call them AI instructions. Um, they're, they're, they're mostly a holdover from the ESP32 S3, uh, which is extensor based. We added a bunch of um, instructions in there and uh, we effectively ported those to the P4. And again, uh, the fact that it's RISC-V is really helpful there because there's just places in the um, uh, in the instruction encoding where we can put those instructions and and not get in the way with uh, with anyone else. So those AI instructions are it, uh, it's mostly SIMD instructions. There's a few FFT instructions and some fast CPIO instructions as well. So that that is what that contains. We call them AI instructions because you know we we envision them mostly being used for AI stuff. So um, the final bit is uh, what we learned uh, from doing the C3 thing and, uh, you know, uh, why the improvements that I just mentioned are there. So first of all, about uh, the transition from uh, Extensor to RISC-V, uh, we actually got a performance improvement out of that. That is not to say that any Extensor um, uh, core will perform lower than any uh, RISC-V core. I mean, it is obviously also very dependent on the types of cores that we have. But in general, we find that for the same amount of silicon, um, uh, at the uh, RISC-V cores that we obviously optimized um, perform a bit better than the Extensor cores. So that is very nice. Um, we also found that it was easier to add features. The extensor core is uh, the extensor cores that we used are a bit a bit opaque. Um, the rich five cores we have uh, we maintain ourselves, so we have all the source code, so it gets a lot easier to add features. You don't have to work around places that you can't uh, you know see. Uh, and as I said before, it turns out it's cheaper. So uh, from here on, um, it is very, very likely that we won't be releasing any extensor chips anymore and that all the next chips that will release will be RISC-V. Um, on the side of software support, uh, migration is pretty easy, actually. Um, uh, all you need to do is take your SDK, and if it's written in C or C++ or any high-level language, you, do, you just need to add support for the lower-level um, uh, devices that, that change, uh, say, interrupt APIs, etc. Uh, but aside from that, um, everything on top of that is just C and just keeps on running. Uh, so our users have had very little difference, at least in ESP IDF. I know that you can just uh, take your old project that was written for an ESP32 that that used an extensor core. And you can just change the target to RISC-V, recompile everything, and uh, there's a high likelihood that everything will just work. What we did find was that RISC-V attracts um, uh, support for other languages and operating systems and SDKs and stuff. 
um, seemingly a lot of external projects that we didn't uh, maintain were like, oh, they have a RISC-V chip. RISC-V is actually something that, that is going to be big and is open source, etc. Um, so they were more interested in adding support for our RISC-V chips than for our Extensor chips. Extensor chips are still seen as a little bit proprietary. Um, we only have a GCC version that we mostly maintain ourselves. There um, used to not be an LLM version for it, so the compiler situation is a bit precarious. For RISC-V, everyone is just like, yeah, it's all there. Why shouldn't we add support for it? So that, that that's a very nice thing to have. Uh, about the custom stuff that we implemented. So the interrupt controller. Uh, initially, uh, I think a, a few projects were a bit hesitant on how to implement like custom stuff for in, uh, for interrupt controller. Uh, but nowadays that, that, that source code is in there. So if we were to stick to that, um, it probably wouldn't be a big problem for existing projects. Um, however, uh, we, we, we do agree that more standardization is better um, also because if there's new projects that want to make use of the C3, for instance, then they still need to, you know, write a custom code for our custom intro controller. Well, if it's a standard click or plick or whatever, then you just reuse the code you have for other uh, RISC-V chips. So the other thing that uh, we still uh, have custom is the AI instruction set. So the AI instruction set is more or less a 128-bit SIMD instruction set. Uh, and as I said before, it also has some FST and fast GPIO instructions. Um, so is it a good idea to still add a fully custom instruction set to our new RISC-V chip? Well, on one hand, we have uh, the fact that we are uh, compatible with the S3 and we can make use of the libraries and tools that are already written for the AI instruction set in the S3. Um, on the other hand, there's also the upcoming P extension to RISC-V, which also does a bunch of SIMD stuff. Uh, wouldn't it be better to implement that? And the answer is maybe. Um, that that standard is not fully ratified yet, if I recall correctly. Um, so there's a thing. Uh, but the other thing is uh, we're talking about instructions now, and RISC-V is extendable. So if we want to in the next chip, we can just implement both, uh, have both support for our custom instruction set as well as for a ratified P extension set. Um, we're not entirely sure how that will go. Um, so that is still something that maybe the next time I speak here, I will I will go into. Uh, we'll see. So uh, that is the end already. I have no idea where I am on time, but I don't have any more slides. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is my this is my uh, email address and our website. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dombru. So do you hear my voice? voice? Yes, I hear you. Okay, so um, so uh, the presentation is open for the questions. So any question, comments? So, um, so well, you know, um, audience is thinking so let me ask one very mm -hmm. open open questions so so uh what do you think about kind of enhancements for ai so there are many probably several ways so extend that it's five things enhancements for ai yeah, yes or some some putting on some ai accelerator or other things would you comment on that? Yeah, so we we do think that it'll get more and more important. As I said, edge AI, which is uh, the use of artificial intelligence in your uh, endpoint devices, so in your in your widgets itself, rather than a widget just being a pipe that sends whatever it needs to process to a server somewhere that then does the processing, uh, like uh, you know, um, uh, voice assistants like Alexa do that at uh, at this point. We do think that um, actually processing sensor input and stuff like that inside the device will get more and more important. Um, so uh, what we want to do is is uh, give people the performance in order to build stuff that can do that. 
And you can already see that for the S3 that we do have a bunch of um, uh, people who try to uh, um, make examples where it's useful to have local AI. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the things um, I don't recall who made it, unfortunately. But one of the things that comes to mind is, for instance, a glass breaking sensor. Um, nowadays, they tend to use very crude um, algorithms, but uh, you could actually use machine learning on that and um, have a better glass breaking sensor by just teaching it what breaking glass looks like. And obviously, if you have a glass breaking sensor, you don't want to send every single noise you hear up to a server in order to process it to see if there's a break in. You, you want to process that locally on your device. And I think um, uh, accelerated uh, uh, AI, specifically in hardware, uh, will help a lot there uh, in order to keep uh, like uh, cost down and, and also energy consumption down because obviously hardware acceleration tends to be more energy efficient than doing things in software. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, partially, yes. <laughs> so any, <laughs> any, any other questions? So, so time schedule comes. So, um, I'll just thank you, Mr. Yelom, and Don Baruch. Thank you very much for the remote you. presentation. So, so, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So,